Amen. He's so good and he's so faithful. It's so good to be in the presence of the Lord today. I just love how the Lord is with us today. We have some exciting things going on here at Good Shepherd. Here in just a few moments, we will be receiving our tithe and offering. There's several ways you can give. You can text the word, well, text the amount that you want to give to 84321. There's also envelopes in the seats in front of you if you'd like to put cash or check in there. They will be coming up the aisles with the buckets and passing the buckets through the aisles to you. And then uh, you can drop your offering in there. There's also a box at the back where you can put your offering and then one up here as well. We want to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for partnering with us with the, what the Lord is calling us to do here at Good Shepherd. I think it's wonderful how he's situated this church in this neighborhood that we can reach our community every single week. Every week we are reaching multiple families to feed them and to encourage them. There's times that they come through that line getting food and then they'll ask for prayer. And they're able to minister to them and then give them food as well. So thank you so much for your generosity. We are still collecting donations for Hamburger Helper. So when you're out shopping, if you want to pick up a box or two, you can place it there in the in the foyer we have hamburger that we give them so providing that it can make a meal for someone and so we want to thank you all so much for your generosity we have a, a mortgage update so right now we are working towards paying off that mortgage and our new mortgage update is two hundred and seventy seven thousand three hundred and ninety nine dollars and seven cents Today we're having Lunch Bunch. It's a great opportunity for some good fellowship after church. We all have to eat lunch somewhere. And so we're going to be, whoever would like to join us, we're going to go to Cheddar's on the Outer Loop, and we're going to have lunch together. So we just invite everyone to join us today. We also have our women's Bible study on Wednesdays at 6.30 with Miss Carolyn Hedden. She leads that up. So ladies, come join us for that. And then next Sunday, we have a treat for you. It is going to be a five-on-five five Sunday. And for some of our new ones here that have not been here for a five-on-five, five, it is a fantastic time. We will have five speakers bring a five-minute message to you, and you are going to love it. It's just wonderful how the Lord always takes everyone five-minute messages and puts them together and they all come together and each other did not know what they were speaking on and the Lord just brings it together and so it's going to be wonderful so we just want to invite you to come be a part of that next Sunday and if our ushers are ready to receive our tithe and offering we're going to go ahead and pray over the offering I just thank the Lord that we have an opportunity to give to him today he's been so good to us amen Father, we just thank you for today, and we thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you for the presence of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can extend our worship into giving today. I thank you that you've blessed us to be able to give to you. And, Lord, we pray blessings over this offering and blessings over everyone in this place. And continue to prepare our hearts as we get ready to receive the word that you've given our pastor. We thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many of you are thankful for God's presence? He is good. He is here. And thank you guys for leading us into the presence of God. I love that song. There's never been a moment that he wasn't in it. He is with us and he will never leave you nor forsake you. And as we are in worship, I'm just reminded of Psalms 16, 11 says this. You will show me the path of life. 
You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. How many know that God will show us the path that we need to take? And when we sense his presence, he leads us and guides us and directs us, and he can change our lives in a moment in his presence. Uh, you can go to school, you can go to counseling, you can be in a, a small group, but when the presence of God comes in, it can truly change our life. So let's never take that for granted, that there is fullness of joy in his presence. Amen. He will show us the path. I want us to look this morning at Psalms 23. We are in a series called The Good Shepherd, and we believe here at Good Shepherd that Jesus is the Good Shepherd. God has given us a vision that we want to reach our community for him, that we want to take the gospel to our city and our state and our country. We want to make disciples of people and multiply those disciples. And I want us to look, we've been talking about in Psalms 23, as you're turning, I want to pray. Father, we thank you for your sweet presence we feel here today. We ask that you would have your way, change us, transform us today, God. Encourage us and convict us, God. I pray that you would do a new work in us, and we thank you for your anointing that makes preaching powerful. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. I'm so glad that you're here today. My name is Pastor Josh, and we're going to look at Psalms 23 just for a moment. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd today? I want you to think about that. You can come to church. You can read the Bible. You can read Christian books, listen to Christian podcasts. But is he your shepherd? Is he leading in God in your life? The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. How many are you thankful that he restores our soul? He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So this is what I want us to look at today, that he leads us. We talked about that he leads us in the green pastures, that as believers we need to look for that green grass. We need to look in front of us, that have a vision that God has prepared a place for us and that we need to rest in those green grass, that it was not a, a big patch of alfalfa, but those were, in the Hebrew, those little green shoots of grass. And throughout the week, you need to look for those moments of rest, those moments of Sabbath in his presence like we felt today. You need to look for those green pastures. We talked last week that he leads us beside the still waters. He restores our soul. And today, I want us to look at this, that he leads us in the paths of righteousness this for his name's sake. And Lindsay has a picture of the paths of righteousness here in, the, in Israel. This is what, when he says a path of righteousness, this is what he... And so sheep were prone to wander. We've talked about this, that sheep weren't the smartest animals. And we are called sheep, and he is the shepherd. And I want us to look at this, and I believe she's got a video. I'm going to prove the point and see if this can relate. Lindsay's got a visit video here of us. How many of us, that would be our life, it seemed like. I see that hand, I see that hand. That he pulls us out of that pit, and what do we do? 20 feet further, we go right down in the same pit. Have you ever been on the wrong path before? If we're honest around this room, we've all been on the wrong path before. The Bible even says this in Isaiah 53, verse 6. It says this, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That all of us as sheep, we have went the wrong path before, but I thank God that God gives us the opportunity to get on the right path. 
that I can't change the, fu- the past. I wish I could. I wish I could go back in time and fix some things. I-, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. But I can't go back, but I can go forward on those paths of righteousness as I follow him and, and be in a, a better place. See, the will of God is not a physical location. And people talk, say, Pastor, I want to know what the will of God is, and I want to be in the will of God. The will of God is not a location, but it is a position of your heart. And for you and I as believers, I've had, I was talking to someone recently, I can't make that decision for you, whether to take the job or not take the job, or to move or not to move. But as a pastor, my responsibility is that your heart is in the right place when you do make those decisions. And so if we want to find the will of God, we must make those decisions with the right heart and the right posture of heart because being out of the will of God is the most miserable place in the world. And every one of us, we have taken that exit and got on the wrong path and it has led us down a place we didn't want to go. But I thank God that he gives us an opportunity. On my 40th birthday, almost coming up on 10 years now, we had this great idea that we were going to hike the Millennium Trail at Burnham. And we were going to hike, it was a 15 mile hike, and we had never, we had done three mile hikes, we had done six mile hikes, we had never done anything like this, we loved to go to Jefferson, it's a two mile hike and it was easy, but we decided for my 40th we were going to prove a point and we were going to do this 15 mile hike and and we started out we had it all of our gear we had our water we had our backpacks we had snacks we had extra socks we had our poles that we were hiking through but the thing was nobody told us in the spring they hadn't cl- cleared the trails yet and so they would often go and clear the trails and cut out the trees that had fallen so here we were Beth and I we were climbing over the trees and we were doing this and I mean what would normally take you know, so many hours it was like doubled because we had to climb over the trees and under the trees. And I believe Lindsay's got a picture. There was like a little triangle on the trees, and it would show you here is the path that you need to take. And so when we were climbing under the trees and over the trees, right there and did a quick burial and so here I am halfway seven or eight miles into a 15 mile hike and we are off the path have you ever got off the path because you weren't following the signs that God gave you and I'll be honest I'm a I don't even know how to say it I love to hike I love to work out but there was a point where you start getting frustrated and I started getting aggravated and I got aggravated at my navigator, and that was my wife. And all of a sudden, how I many you get that? You get aggravated. I, somebody said, when you get married, you not only get a, a partner, a, a lover, but you get a navigator for the rest of your life. That's going to tell you the path you you ought to take. And so here we are in the middle of the woods, lost, and there's tombstones beside us, and we didn't know what in the world to do, and we started to panic. I started to panic. She says. And I'll be honest, and I'm not a really an angry person. I took my little pole and I wrapped it around one of those trees out there in Burnham. I know you guys would never do that. But not only did I get scared, I got angry. And then I started taking it out on my, the person I love more than anybody. Let me know that when we get off the wrong path, it affects those that are around us. It affects our attitude. It affects us our relationships but friends we eventually we got found by the rescue we were right there on the edge of the property it was getting dark and all of a sudden we found somebody and they drove us back to our car but it was a very scary moment and being on the wrong path is very scary and the thing is you know when you're on the wrong path see we started out on the right trail but we got lost Do you know that you can start out right and end up in the wrong place? 
all because you took a U-turn, all because you took an exit, when God said, I want you to go, keep going, keep pressing in, and, and you got off the trail. But here is the good news, the good shepherd rescues us from the wrong path. You can be on the wrong path for many, many years and decades even, and all of a sudden, by the grace of God, he was rich in mercy, that he pulls us out of that wrong path, and he puts us on the right path. The Bible says that Jesus comes and he, he rescued the one. He left the 99 to rescue the one. Friends, we better make sure that we're walking on the right path because your family is following you. Your kids and your grandkids are picking up on what you do, not just what you say. They are picking up on your reactions and your responses and your actions. We better make sure we're on the right path. But I thank God that he not only takes us from the wrong path, puts us on the right path. And even on the right path, you can get in a rut. If we're being honest, well, we, don't, we don't do it out of devotion or commitment to God or love for God. We lose our first love and we just go through the routines or we just go through the motions and we can get in a rut on the right path. And so I want to give you four things real quick today. How do I know that I'm on the right path? Here was the first one. I'm going to use the acronym uh, uh, PATH, P-A-T-H. The first P is peace. Do you know when you're on the right path, there ought to be peace. The Bible says that we are to go out with joy and we are to be led by peace. How many understand that? When we are on the path that God has provided for us, we ought to have peace. Now, I'm not saying there's not going to be mind games. The devil is going to lie to you, try to distract you, discourage you, cause anxiety to you. We've talked before, people said, I want to serve, but I've heard people preach and talk that there's new levels and there are new devils. That's not actually in the Bible. I believe when you go up to that next level and you get on the right path, there's going to be new mind games. And you need to experience the peace and the presence of God to let you know that you've made the right decision. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 55, 12, if you're taking notes. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountain and the hill shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The, the A of path is adversity. You know that you're going to have peace but you're also going to have adversity even when you do what's right. You're going to have family members that are going to try to discourage you from doing what you know you ought to do. You're going to have friends that you used to hang out with all the time and they no longer want to hang out with you anymore. There's going to be adversity. I remember when God had called us into the ministry and I was excited and we were ready to take, charge hell with a water pistol. And then we had to tell our family that we felt this is what God called us to do. And they're like, you're crazy. Because everybody in my family, my dad owns a successful tire business. All my other relatives, they worked at the refinery back home in Ashland. And so that was automatically going to be the path. But God had marked us and God had burdened us and God had called us. To, to, to pastor and preach the word of God. So this was all new. And they didn't discourage us, but they didn't necessarily encourage us. I mean, sometimes you just need a little encouragement. Uh, you're doing the right thing. So there's going to be adversity even when you're on the right path. This is what the Bible says in Psalms 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We're talking about being on the paths of righteousness. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of some of them. My Bible says that he delivers us out of all of them. Even when there's adversity, that God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Even when it doesn't add up, even when I can't figure it out, God will make a way. So just because you face a little adversity, don't run, don't hide, don't give up. But pray and ask God to give you faith and to give, the, give you grace to make it throughout the day and the week. Here's the T, a path. So we have peace, we have adversity. The T is transformation. We're on the path of God. God ought to change your life. 
When you're doing what God's called you to do, it ought to change your life. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. We're not conforming to what everybody else says or what everybody else does or what everybody else thinks that we are different. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If you want to find the will of God, allow the word of God to transform your life. And he will direct your steps. I've said it before that the word of God is like a map. And we need to follow his map. And when we have that map, we need to meditate on the word of God. You need to meditate your thinking on the word of God and he will show you the way. You need to apply the word of God. Not just read it like it's a novel, but you need to apply the word of God. If that's reading a proverb a day. Today's the 25th, so read Proverbs 25 all throughout the month. Read the Word of God and apply the Word of God, and it will change your life, and you will find the word, the will of God. The next one was you need to pray the Word of God. Whatever it says to do, and you say, Pastor, I can't do that. that. That sounds good on paper, but God give me faith to obey the Word of God. Not just be a hearer of the Word, but a doer of the Word. So let's go back. There ought to be transformation. God transformed my life. I shared before that I grew up a a bitter young man. And my dad is now a, a preacher of the word, and God radically saved him. But when I was growing up, I was before I was 10 or so, we weren't that close. But he got radically saved and God changed his life. And I wanted to find out what was going on. He started a new path. And when he decided to to follow Jesus, I wanted to find out about it even as a bitter young man. And so I went to the service at church about like this. I sat in the middle and the pastor preached and stared at me the whole service. I thought, But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit began to draw me, and I ran to an altar of prayer. And guess what? Where there was bitterness, there's now the love of God. My dad and I have a great relationship. I have been transformed all by the grace of God. And what he's done for me, he can do for you. But when you're on that path, there ought to be transformation. The Bible says that we are a new creation in Christ. You're not the same old person. You don't have the same old habits that we have surrendered to him. Amen? Let me read this. It says here in 2 Corinthians 5.11, He made us who... For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Praise God. That's transformation. That I am right with God through Jesus Christ. You know what the word righteousness means? That you have God's approval. Think about that. That I'm walking now with God's approval. And I'm following after him on this journey and I have God's approval. I don't serve to get God's approval. I don't come to church to get God's approval. I have God's approval so I want to serve. I want to connect with the family of Christ. Amen? Have you been transformed? Here's the age of path. There needs to be healing in our life. If we're being honest, we need healing. And we've seen people that were healed of cancer. We've seen people that weren't able to have kids. I think we're like like 15 families now. They weren't able to have kids and God did a miracle in their life here and they've got children now. And we give God all the glory for that. We have people with with deaf ears opened up, blinded eyes opened up, and God has restored marriages at home. But there's no greater miracle than salvation. There's no greater miracle than God making someone new and alive. It's not about going from being a bad person to a good person, but it's about going from a dead person to alive. And I'm no longer dead today, but I am alive in Christ. And he wants to heal our lives and change our lives. Let him heal your marriage. Let him heal your family. Let him heal you spiritually. As I said, my dad has a couple of successful tire shops. And I got to work with him 
in the summers many times as a teenager. And one thing, we had people come in often, and they would have metal sticking out the edge of their tire. Have you ever seen maybe on your tire where it was good tread on one part, but on the edges it seemed like there was a little bit of metal sticking out. They were wore down, and the problem was it wasn't a defective tire. It was that your car was out of alignment. And what tires that should have lasted 50,000 miles were dead or or wore down in 15,000 miles, all because they were out of alignment. Something wasn't lined up on the car. And I believe a lot of Christians that we are out of line with God. That it says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, but we are wore out. We're living afraid. We're living on edge. We're frustrated and aggravated. When we ought to be living in the presence of God. Yes, there is adversity. Yes, there are trials. Yes, there are tribulations. But are you out of alignment with God? You know what God wants you to do. You know the path that is set before you. But you're out of alignment with God. Not pastor, I just I'm on edge all the time. Friends, you need to come back and get in alignment with God. You're not going to find peace until you make peace with God. That doesn't mean you have to become a a missionary to El Salvador or Africa. You can live for God right here in Louisville, Kentucky, Mount Washington, Shepherdsville, Taylor, wherever you live. You can live for Jesus right here. But it's our responsibility that I'm going to get in line with God. That if he wants me to pray, I'm going to spend time with God in prayer. If he wants me to spend time in the word of God, I'm going to read my devotions. He wants me to give, I'm going to give. He wants me to connect at church, I'm going to make that effort. I'm I'm tired of being out of alignment with God. Because you're wearing yourself out. We make it harder than what it actually is to be on that path. So I want to ask you this morning, will you follow the good shepherd? So he pulls us out of the wrong path, puts us on the new path, and so we have a decision, are we going to follow the good shepherd? So who are you following? I want to show you a wolf. I believe Lindsay has a wolf picture. Lindsay, back there. Involved in the process, but don't be consumed where you lose your peace and your joy over the news every week. We talked about it at small group on Wednesday. We need to think about what we're thinking about. And some of you already know what you're going to vote, so don't have to watch the news 24 hours a day. So are we going to follow Jesus? Listen to what the Bible says in Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 24 through 26 And then Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So if we truly believe he's the good shepherd and we believe God is good, do we trust him enough to follow him? If we don't think he's the good shepherd and we don't believe ultimately that God is good, There's a problem. Because even with a good God, bad things happen. There are people that have a free will that do evil in this world 
and have done evil to every person in this room in one way or another, personally or, or, or to our family or even to the church, but bad things happen to good people sometimes, but that doesn't mean God's not good. So I'm going to make a decision, and I'm going to follow him. Notice what Jesus said. If you want to follow me, you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Are you willing to lose your life to find his? Are we willing to lose our life that we may find it? I've shared before about Mary with the, the perfume, and she, she broke open the alabaster box, and here was Judas and said, well, why would you waste all of that perfume? Don't you know what we could have done with that money? You're just wasting that. And sometimes I feel like we have friends and we have family members. Why would you waste your life for Jesus? Why would you waste a Sunday to come to church and worship with other believers? Friends, I want you to know I will waste my life for Jesus every day. I'm going to waste every Sunday for Jesus. I'm going to waste every, every time that I have devoted. I'll waste it. How many know it's not a waste? But other people look and say, oh, that's just, a, you know what you could be doing? You know where you could be? You know, I can go do that after church. But I'm going to waste my life for God. He said, if you're willing to lose your life, you'll find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their own soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Are we willing to follow Jesus all the way? We used to sing that song, I've decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, I'm still going to follow Jesus. Friends, and we need to have that heart and say, God, I want to follow you. And it may be counter to our society and our culture today, and we may go against the string, but I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow him. Let me give you three quick prayers found in Psalms real quick. I want you to turn over to Psalms 31.3 if you're there in Psalms 23. Psalms 31.3 says this. Here's a couple prayers. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? So if we're going to follow him. On the paths of righteousness, I want us to notice that it was for his name's sake. That I'm not following him just for my benefit. Look at Psalms 5, 8. If you have your Bible or take a notes, it says this, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. Isn't that a good prayer? In your righteousness, lead me, Lord. Let's look at Psalms 25, verse 4 and 5. This is a beautiful prayer. I want you to meditate on this way as we're following the Good Shepherd. Psalms 25, verse 4 and 5. Show me your ways, O Lord. Show me your ways, Lord. Pastor, I don't know what to do. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs that wisdom cries out in the streets. God's still speaking whether you listen or not. And so I, I haven't heard from God where you've not turned on your Bible app or opened the Bible in, in a month. It's hard for him to speak when you don't open the word. Show me your way, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait all the day. That I'm, I'll wait on the Lord. And sometimes we say, well, God's too slow. God's not too slow. You're too pa impatient. How many things that we're waiting on say, God, you better hurry it up. And he's saying, you've got yourself in a mess, and i got to cut out all the red tape. You've got yourself in a bind, and i got to orchestrate all the things. And it says here, I'll wait on you all day, God. Amen. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, There is nothing which is more insulting to the holy name of God than to profess him with your lips 
and deny him with your life. It's easy to come here and sing songs about Jesus. But it's a whole other story when we make a decision, I'm going to follow the good shepherd. Say, God, I want to live for you all the days of my life. Last scripture here says this, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. How many know that Jesus is the narrow gate? And many of us have been taught, you know, before we can be accepted or approved, we got to we got to do things a certain way, and then come to you no, know, we come to Jesus and let Him transform us. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the narrow way. There's only one way. And it's found in Jesus. It's not about finding your pastor. I just got to find myself. No, you don't need to find yourself. You need to lose yourself. Lose it in him. Surrender to him. If we're going to make the destination that God has for us. If somebody can come play something softly. Um, I don't even know how long it's been now. My sister Micah got married in, in Gatlinburg. And, and so they brought the whole family down there. And they asked me to officiate the wedding. So here I was, I was prepared. And I had a navigator. And I won't say her name, but it's Beth. And Beth was navigator. And so the wedding was in Brown Road. And so she just Googled Brown Road and looking for the place the chapel for the wedding so here we were we ended up we were down in the mountains we got lost in Gatlinburg have you ever got lost in Gatlinburg because of the traffic and we put Brown Road Gatlinburg and we're going through the mountains we can't find nothing we're turning around we're in loops but the wedding was in Brown Road Sevierville <laughs> we were never going to get there the way we were going we could have drove all day long, but we had the wrong starting point, and we were never going to end up at our destination. They did the wedding without me. My dad did the wedding. We got to go to the, the, the lunch afterwards, but it was embarrassing. But many of us, were, we, we have a destination one day. I want to spend eternity with God. New heavens and a new earth. But friends, if you don't start out the right way, you're never going to make that destination. You're going to keep going in circles and circles and circles. But today, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because I can guarantee you that if you put your faith in Jesus, you confess Him as Lord of your life, you repent of your sins and you surrender and submit and follow him, you're going to make that destination one day. You may have to go through loops and valleys and turns and mountain peaks and, and low points of life, but one day, I feel that by the Spirit of God, you're going to make that destination. He is the narrow way. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and he rose again on the third day, giving us new life and eternal life today. And he's saying today, I want to take you off the wrong path and I want to put you on the right path. But until you allow the good shepherd to put you on the right path, you're never going to find the right destination. You're just going to keep going in circles and circles and circles of life. Today, I want to encourage you to put your faith in him and his righteousness God's approval. You're not trying to earn approval. You're not trying to be good enough to, for him to approve you. No, I'm approved through Jesus. The finished work of Jesus. Before we receive communion here in a moment, I want us to pray. Would you pray over this? Say, Father, I pray that you would just search our hearts, O oh God. Search our hearts, O oh God. God, we want to be on the right path. 
We all admitted that we've been on that wrong path before. We were headed down the wrong road. But today I thank you that you allow U-turns, that we can turn around today and get on that right path. But I'm praying today, God, that we won't only get on the right path, but we're going to follow you the right way. We're going to follow the good shepherd. I can follow you because I know that you're good. You're not leading us to the slaughterhouse. You're leading us to the, the right spot, the promised land. Every hip bowed and every eye closed just for a minute. But if you're here today and say, Pastor, I, I've been on the wrong path. I want to make things right with God today. Would you wave at me? We're going to pray. You don't have to take a class. You don't have to take a program. You don't have to sign up for nothing. You don't have to give nobody your number or email. But today, I say, Pastor, I want to make things right with God today. Before we receive communion, the Bible talks that we need to examine our heart. This is that moment. Are there areas of your life? Say, God, I know this is the path God has in front of me. I want to make peace with God. And that's been done through Jesus. Thank you for that hand. Is there one more? I'm not going to embarrass you. But we're going to make things right. This is why we do what we do. We want to share the gospel. We want to make disciples. We want God to change our lives, transform us. Anybody else? Thank you for that hand. There's another one. Anybody else? We're just making things right with God. So, Pastor, I've been on the wrong path, and I'm ready for the right path. I'm tired of going in circles. I'm tired of, of my being on edge and being out of alignment with God. Anybody else before we pray? Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? There's three. Anybody else? We're making things right with God today. This is what it's all about. We're making things right with God. You've been on the wrong path been out of alignment with God I know the path God show me the path I mean being out of alignment it can pull your car to one way or another you're trying to do what's right but it keeps pulling you off road it's because you're out of alignment with God but today we're going to make peace with God through Jesus we're going to have faith in him would you pray with me say Father Forgive me for doing life my own way. I admit I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me and coming back again. Thank you, Jesus, for new life and eternal life. Transform me today. Change me today set me on that good path and I'm going to follow you in Jesus name Amen come on just thank him just for a moment thank you for the peace of God thank you for the peace of God thank you for the peace of God come on we're just making peace with God today Ron would you and Hunter help me with the communion plates would you care to help me grab those real quick we practice an open communion. You don't have to be a member of our church. You don't have to sign up for an email or nothing, but the Bible says you need to be a believer. Take a moment. We're going to just make things right with God. You've, we prayed, but the Bible says for us to do this in remembrance of Him. If you guys just come on up. But here's what I want you to do. Just take a moment. I want you to stand, turn the cameras off so you, you don't have to worry about being on Facebook or whatever this is a holy moment so I want you to come receive the elements again you 